Before we begin, a few short things. First of all, our organization, Torch, is shipping free gifts to anyone who wants them. We're giving away mitzvah magnets. These are nifty little devices that attach to light switches and cover them and thereby make observing shops a bit easier. If you have not yet done so, please visit our website, torchweb.org. You'll see a banner on the homepage. Click on the banner, put in your info, and we'll ship to you up to five mitzvah magnets, up to five torch Shabbat light switch covers for free. And a reminder, please make sure to fill out the form completely so we know exactly where and to whom to ship it. Also, there are two new podcasts that I'd like to plug. First of all, my dear friend and colleague, Rabbi Elchanan Shaf, he launched a special Daf Yomi podcast called Daf Yomi Breitnek. And the upshot of this is, you know, Daf Yomi is studying a page of Talmud every day. And this is only one episode a week. Every Sunday, he releases a new episode that covers seven pages of Talmud from the preceding week in two hours. Check that out. Rabbi Elchanan Shaf, the Daf Yomi Breakneck podcast. And finally, my dear friend and partner, Dan Coleman, launched a podcast called The Shema Podcast. And the tagline for that is Podcast for the Perplexed. And he is a Balchuva who's going to share his Torah insights intertwined with his own personal stories that demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvahs. He just released episode two where he interviews me. So if you want to listen to that, check it out, the Shema Podcast. Search for it on your favorite podcast app. So three things. Number one, Torch, Shabbat Light Switch Covers, The Myths and Magnets on our website, torchrub.org, and the two podcasts, the Dafyomi Breakneck and the Shema Podcast. Check it out. As always, my email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. So how old is the universe? From what I've researched and from all the answers that I've seen, the best we have are estimates. It's a very difficult question, of course, for us today to try to reverse engineer, to try to figure out how, how long ago the universe began. And it's not so clear if we have a precise answer, regardless if you look at the Torah consensus or the science consensus. In the scientific community, of course, science is heralded by the, by the idea of the scientific method. If you have a new approach, you're always testing it and you're going to discard older approaches. So in the early part of the 20th century, the vast majority of the world scientists believed in what's called a steady state model, namely that the world is eternal, was around forever, and it had very little dynamism. It wasn't changing. It wasn't, it wasn't expanding. It wasn't contracting. It was fixed. That idea, of course, not a new idea. It's a theory that was postulated by the ancient Greeks. And in fact, if you look at the Talmud, when the Talmud talks about the various kinds of quote-unquote heresy that existed, the most common heresy of the time was the concept called Olam Kadmon, which means in, in English, the world precedes. The world's been around forever, and the world is fixed and eternal. In fact, you see that being discussed by the medieval commentators in the Talmud. It's a big subject of, of the, this Greek philosophy of the eternal world. All that changed in the 1960s. In the 1960s, with the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, essentially that's the, the echo, so to speak, of the Big Bang, the idea of a steady state model, the idea of a fixed universe that's not changing, that was definitively refuted, and everyone agreed that the world had a beginning. I like to say that it took 3,000 years for the scientists to accept the first word of the Torah, Beratius, there was a beginning. The rest of the Torah was still working on it. Now, how exactly, how old is the universe? That's where it gets a little complicated, because how exactly do you measure it? It's a very difficult question that the that the uh, cosmologists discuss. So there's different answers. Uh, in the 80s, they used to talk about a 15.4 billion year old universe. Uh, it, most most recently, in the re- most recent decade, they've amended that maybe 13.8, 13.7 billion years. I like to say, you know, what's 1.6 billion years amongst friends, give or take. That's also we don't have a precise figure according to the scientific consensus. It's uh, a nine-digit uh, figure. It's a, it's it's in the tens of billions. You know what the precise number is. No one really seems to know. Okay, so that's the scientific consensus. What about the Torah? What about the Jewish 
philosophers and theologians and cosmologists, what do we say? Do we have a precise age of the universe? So it's a very tricky question. If you ask uh, many Jews, they'll tell you that today, according to Jewish tradition, we're in the year 5780, 5780 since Adam. Now, it's important to stress that the origin of that number is not found in the Talmud. It's not like some, it's not like authoritative text that tells us, oh, we're right now in the year 5780. Where do we know that number? So I'll tell you how we know that number. If you look at chapter 5 of Genesis, chapter 5 of Genesis enumerates the generations from Adam to Noah, and it tells us how, how old Adam was when his son was born, and how old his son was born when his grandson was born, and it gives us the dates, and we could just add up the dates, and we could say, well, you know, the, the year uh, 1022 or so, uh, Noah was born, and then we come from Noah to Abraham, that's in chapter 10 of Genesis, and how old Abraham was when Isaac was born, at another 100 years, how old how old was Isaac when Jacob was, Jacob was born, and so on, he was 60, we had 60 years, and we go throughout, throughout the rest of the Torah, the Torah gives us these timestamps, and then we move on to the books of the prophets, and so on, and therefore, if we add those numbers till today, we have the year 5780, so it's not a precise methodology, in fact, you know, someone asked the question, what about months? You don't imagine that Adam had his child on his birthday. He was 130 years old when his son was born, but maybe there was a few more months there, right? So is it a precise number? It's hard to say because you would imagine that you know, the odds are you would have a few more months. And, you know, each one of those generations, you had a few months. On average, you know, five, six months. Well, then you're already adding more years. So is 5780 a precise number? I don't know. It doesn't seem likely that it would be exactly precisely uh, on the birthday. In fact, if you open up a Jewish publication, Torah, many Torah publications, when they write the date of, of the year of the publication, they'll add three letters, a Lamed, a Fe, and a Kuf. A Lamed, a Fe, and a Kuf. The year, 5780, Lamed, Fe, Kuf. What does that mean? What that means is, Lefi Kabbalah Seinu. 5780, as per our tradition. Meaning, we're not saying this is the definitive age. We're saying this is a based upon our tradition. We can, we can have this consensus. It seems like based upon tradition that this is the age of, of, of the world or of the universe. And that's why we're not, we're, we're not, we're not uh, taking an authoritative stance. It's not definitive. It seems likely according to our tradition. Now, I want to stress that when we ask the question, how old's the universe from a Torah or a Jewish perspective? And we say 5780, give or take a couple of decades, let's say, yeah, around, you know, 5,000, somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000, you know, give or take a couple of, uh, of decades or centuries. When we say that, there's a, there's an assumption baked into that figure, namely that the universe and the world, the universe begins with Adam, right? If, if we're only counting from Adam, what happened before Adam? Those mysterious six days. Adam, of course, only appears on day six of Genesis. Well, what happens prior to that? We have lots of stuff that are happening, and we only start the clock from Adam and once he starts having children. So that's maybe an angle to try to reconcile these two figures. And also, perhaps there's a different timeline for the age of the world since Adam and the age of the universe since the initial inception of the universe. But regardless, there is a significant disparity between these two numbers. 6,000, around 6,000, and around 15 billion. That's not a rounding error. That, that's, that's a very large figure that, uh, that we ought to consider if we should try to reconcile. Now, before we present uh, several ways to do that, I think there's an important question to consider. Perhaps we should say we don't need to reconcile it. If there are heretics and they want to come up with their heresy, let them live with their heresy. Why must we reckon with what they think? Are we perhaps giving legitimacy to heresy by saying, well, they say this and we say that and, and they're in conflict, but they're wrong. Or maybe they're right. And let's try to reconcile those two. Does it really have to fit? Must we bend over backwards to try to accommodate them? Maybe, this is the argument, maybe we should say that, you know, we don't care what science says. We have Torah. We've been right since the beginning. It took them 3,000 years after all to come around to the first word of the Torah. 
So we see I mean, history shows us we haven't had to adapt and amend anything. The Torah hasn't been changed. And they have. Well, maybe, maybe there's indications that we're right and they're wrong and let's leave it the way it is. Maybe we ought not to engage in polemics with the scientists. And in fact, there's maybe a good argument for that. You know, if you look at the history of the discarded theories that were universally accepted in the scientific community, there's a long list there. There's a long list of what they call superseded theories, beliefs that were widely accepted, that were ubiquitous in the scientific community, that were eventually discarded. Well, maybe this 15.4, 13.8 billion figure will also eventually be discarded. And they'll come around to realize it's really 5,780 years old. Maybe. Maybe that's the argument. I don't subscribe to that view for a few reasons. First of all, there is a teaching, a very famous teaching in the Midrash that tells us as follows. Quote, if someone comes over you and tells you there's wisdom in the nations, believe them. If they say there's Torah in the nations, don't believe them. Do the nations have wisdom? Says the Midrash. Says them, of course they do. They do. There's something there. There's legitimacy that we have to reckon with to accept that. Torah? Well, not that they don't have Torah. We have Torah. But do they have wisdom? Does the general world, for sure? Ergo, the Talmud's telling us that we have to acknowledge that there is wisdom out there that is legitimate. In fact, the Talmud tells us, if you're ill, what do you do? You go to the physician. You go to the expert. What do they know? If God wants me alive, God will keep me alive. So that's the Talmud. No, that's a mistake. Go to the physician. Go to the best medical practitioners because they have wisdom. They have experience. They know what they're doing. They're experts in their field. We do vaccinate. We don't say, hey, what do the scientists know? They're all charlatans. We don't say that. That's not the Torah way. The Torah way is to acknowledge that there is wisdom out there. We don't have a monopoly on wisdom. And therefore, the scientists know what they're talking about. And there, there's some legitimacy to what they say. I think that's argument A. Argument B is that we don't believe that Torah and science are necessarily disparate on this level. Meaning, we believe the Torah is divine. Written Torah, oral Torah. It comes from God. But where does the world come from? Where does the... The infrastructure of the world, the science, the physics of the world, where does that come from? We believe it also comes from God. The Torah, well, that's the Almighty's mind, the Almighty's wisdom. The science, the world, the physics, well, it's the Almighty's handiwork. They're both the byproducts of the Almighty. And therefore, it's impossible for them to be at odds. If they are at odds, we would say that either you don't understand the Torah or you don't understand the science. Because if the Almighty is orchestrating both, then they have to align, they have to be, they have to work together, they have to fit together, they have to dovetail with each other. Therefore, we believe that the contradictions between science and Torah must be superficial. In fact, there is a astonishing teaching in the Rambam. Of course, the Rambam is one of the great authorities of Jewish philosophy and, and, and Torah law. And he's asking the following question. There is a mitzvah, there is a verse in the Torah, a very famous verse that tells us we have to love God with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our resources. So the Ram asked the question, wait a minute, Jewish theology, it's one of the most difficult subjects to ponder. In fact, unlike other religions, we don't make a big deal about studying, about studying theology. We don't study the nature of God. Why? Because we acknowledge it's beyond us. By definition, theology is beyond human intellect. And therefore, if you look at, at the Jewish literature on the subject, it's, it's very limited because we're acknowledging we don't understand how God operates and how he works. Yet, the verse tells us, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you should love the Almighty God. How could you love something that you don't even understand? How, how can you connect to something that's beyond you? That's the question the Rama poses. And he offers, based upon the Midrash, three solutions. He says there's a workaround. There's a loophole. There's a shortcut. When we try to connect to God, it's not via theology. It's via other things. Why do we have Torah? 
Why do we have science? Why do we have mitzvos? These are means to get around the problem of theology to connect to God. The Almighty gives us his wisdom in the Torah. And therefore we connect to Torah and by extension we connect to God. The Almighty gives us his world, the science, his handiwork. By connecting to that, by ruminating over that, by absorbing the wisdom inherent in science in the world, we connect to the Almighty. Meaning that not only is Torah and science not contradictory by Jewish philosophical standards, they're complementary. Both of them are tools that we can use to connect to God. The Torah is the Almighty's wisdom. The science is the Almighty's handiwork. And both of them are means via which, they're proxies via which we can connect to God. So to suggest that the Torah is sacrosanct and the Torah is divine and the science, they're a bunch of charlatans. What do they know? They're kind of working on, on the opposite team. We would say no. We would say the Torah is the Almighty's wisdom. The science is the Almighty's handiwork. And thus, we face the question, what do we do when two of the Almighty's, so to speak, teachings, the Torah and the science, seem to come to very different answers to a very fundamental question, how old is the universe? If science seems pretty convinced, and I have to admit I'm not a scientist, but from what I've read, scientists are pretty convinced that we're talking about in the, the multiple billions of years. And according to Jewish tradition, the number is around 6,000. Is there any way to reconcile those two figures? So that's the question. So I want to quickly give you three approaches that maybe you have heard, and then we're going to spend a lot of time on the fourth approach that, in all likelihood, you have not heard. So there's one approach that says as follows. When the Almighty created the world... He didn't create it as an infant world, as a nascent world. In fact, Adam, on day one of his existence, does something quite memorable with the teeth when he chews the fruit or the apple. Wait a minute. Even though one on, I think, 2,500 babies is born with a tooth. But clearly, we, we meet Adam as, as mature. Adam's created as mature. Is it possible that the Almighty created a brand new world, but he created it as being already advanced? Adam has teeth to chew, and all the trees, they weren't necessarily just little saplings. Were there, you know, 100-foot cedar trees? Yes, maybe. It was a full, robust world. So, you know, if you were to cut open one of those trees, that's, you know, day one, would it have like 100 rings in it? Maybe, because it was it's an old tree, even though it's it's new. So that's one of the arguments that, yes, the world is simultaneously, let's say, around 6,000 years old, but it does give off the appearance as being much older, much more ancient, because when it was created, it was created already ancient. And again, there's no way for us to prove it or, or not, but that's a, that is a mainstream normative position to answer this question. That's the speculation. Okay, that's, that's one school of thought. The second stool of thought, and I don't think this is necessarily a comprehensive answer, but it's another angle that is germane to the subject, and that is that the scientists have not necessarily included supernatural occurrences in their model. So, for example, you look at Genesis, and you read about the flood. This is a cataclysmic event that is not part of the normal, you know, there's not a thousand-year flood. This is a once-in-history flood because the Almighty said it, it's supernatural. It's the Almighty intervening in the rules of nature and the rules of physics. Well, if we want to study the world and we're using whatever tools we have to do that, we're assuming that the rules of physics have not been interrupted since creation. Well, if you read Genesis, it's clearly multiple times that it has been interrupted. So maybe that's going to play with the numbers because there are events that maybe have accelerated the apparent aging, even though in time they haven't, because the rules of physics have been, have been interrupted. So for example, you know, when if you will find, if you find a deep sea fossil in middle of a country, inland, does that mean that there was an ice age? Or maybe 
if the whole world is covered with, you know, 500 feet of water, that's going to create a lot of shifting of, of fossils. That would be the argument, and that's a second stool of thought. There is a third stool of thought that approaches the question thusly. Yes, the world is around 6,000 years old, plus six days. You have these six days of creation that are not ordinary days. And the reason for that is, or the logic behind that is, because after all, you know, the way we mark a day, it has a lot to do with the sun. The sun arrives in the horizon in the morning, and the next time it arrives in the horizon, well, that's day two. If you read the Genesis narrative, the sun appears on day four. So what exactly determined the transition from day one to day two, day two to day three, day three to day four, it's, it's an open mystery. Because it's obviously not using the same rules that we use today. So there are various ways. In fact, there's books written on this particular approach that yes, the world is simultaneously 6,000 years old around since Adam. But since the first day of creation, since the word in the beginning, those six days before Adam arrives, looking back, it looks like 15 billion years or so. That would be a third approach. And again, each one of these, I'm just giving you the basic highlights, the basic, the abstract, if you will. But there's entire books and essays and lots of scholarship baked into these, these approaches. I want to expose you to a, to a fourth approach. This approach, I read it in the writings of Rabbi Arya Kaplan. I've heard of him. He was um, a famous rabbi, lived recently, passed away, I think, in 1983, if I'm not mistaken. He was a rabbi, uh, an author, and uh, a physicist. He was, he was a polymath, essentially. Uh, he was someone whose, whose writings were so voluminous. He was so prolific as a writer, as an author, as a translator. And even though he only, he, you know, he only lived till 48 years old, there's a veritable bookcase of his writings on all matters of Torah. He was, in fact, one of the world's experts on matters of Kabbalah. Very, very advanced, uh, advanced scholar and tragically passed away quite young. He gave a lecture in 1979 to an academy of scientists where he unveiled a, a little bit complex, a multi-layered, multi-pronged answer resolution to this question. And it's based upon an opinion in a Kabbalistic book called the Sefer Hatimuna, attributed to one of the sages of the Mishnah, of the Mishnahite era, named Rabbi Nechunya ben Hakana. It's a very important Sefer in the Kabbalistic corpus. In fact, it's quoted by the Ramban Nachmanides. Nachmanides you know, lived in the 13th century, so this is a very ancient commentary of the Torah. And it's quoted by others. It's one of the important basic works of the Kabbalah that is attributed to being 2,000 years old. So this is not a new book that was written today to respond to the apologetics needed to reconcile modern questions of Torah and science. This answer is based upon the following idea. We open up the Torah. We read about Bereshus, creation. And chapter 2 already we read about Adam. And, of course, the clock starts ticking with Adam. Let's assume that these six days are not necessarily days that are going to add billions to the count. Let's assume that these are regular six days, just for the, for the, for the sake of argument. We're going to take that as a given. However, is this the first universe or the first world that the Almighty created? Were there other worlds that preceded ours? Interesting question. Well, what do we know? So tell what we know. There are various references in very ancient Jewish literature that indeed there were worlds that preceded ours. So, for example, you have a teaching in the Midrash. Again, Midrash is attributed to the Talmudic era. We're talking about at least 1,500 years old. The Midrash in Bracious Rabbah which is the largest Midrash book, is called Midrash Rabbah, and it has one in each one of the books. So Bereshus is the Genesis, the, the, the Midrash commentary in Genesis. And this is uh, chapter 9, and this is teaching number 2. It talks about the verse in the beginning of Genesis. And behold, God saw all that he did. And behold, it was exceedingly good. 
So this is after creation's done. The Almighty is assessing his work. It's exceedingly good. Says the Midrash. What does this mean? So one of the opinions of the Midrash is, from this we see that maybe there were other creations that weren't as good. <laughs> this one is fantastic. We finally got the perfect uh, balance, right? The ingredients, everything works out perfectly. Maybe there were other creations that weren't quite as good. Again, this is quoted from Rabbi Avahu, one of the sages of the Talmud. From this we learn that the Holy One, blessed is he, was creating worlds and destroying worlds until he created this world. And then he said, and then he opined, this world is good. The other worlds are not good. Now, what kind of wrench does this throw into our conversation? There were worlds that preceded ours. And that may be very relevant to the question of how old the universe is. Because how old the world is is one question. How old the universe? Well, maybe that starts from world number one. With the initial conception, so to speak, God decides to create the finite universe. Well, maybe that was much earlier than the world that we have. Okay. So what does this mean that the money was creating worlds? and destroying worlds. So it's important to note that the Arizal, who is the most authoritative voice on on Kabbalah, he was not a proponent of this approach of the Sefer Timuna, And he interpreted this particular Midrash as not referring to physical worlds, that they might have created physical worlds and destroyed them, rather they might have created spiritual worlds and destroyed them. So it's very important to stress that this opinion is not accepted by the Arizal and uh, and his followers, even though there is still a trickle effect. There are still some of the followers of the Arizal and even, the, of course, his predecessors that have not only adopted this, this approach, they've promoted it. So we have this idea that the, there were worlds that preceded ours. They might have created them, destroyed them. And finally, when he created this one, it was exceedingly good. This is the right one. So again, we have the Arizal says, no, it's referring to spiritual worlds. And then we have others and very reputable sources, I may add, that this means or this refers to physical worlds that predated ours. So that's source number one, the Midrash in Bracious Rabbah. The second source is from a very famous teaching in the book of Shabbos and Talmud. And of course, Talmud is absolutely authoritative in our Jewish philosophy, the Talmud. It's the oral law. And it's talking about what happened when Moses ascended to heaven to get the Torah. So, in fact, we just read it this week. We read the description, the narrative of Sinai. We have the Ten Commandments. And then Moses is going up to heaven. He's going up to the next world, so to speak, to spend time with the Almighty, to get the Torah, to get the bulk of the Torah, to get the details of the Torah, and to bring it back down. Of course, he comes back down. There's an unhappy surprise waiting for him. And we know the story as, as it's told in the book of Exodus. But what happens once Moses actually gets to heaven? Of course, the Almighty is there, and the angels are there, and the angels are absolutely flummoxed by the arrival of the earthling, Moses. And they say to God, Master of the world, what is this child of a woman doing amongst us? Which is how they describe Moshe. Which, parenthetically, what I'll tell you is, Philosophically, we believe that Moses became like an angel. So you'll notice that when the angels talk about Moses, they don't describe him as they would describe other humans. The other humans they describe as flesh and blood. Moses, they talk about his humanity is limited to his pedigree. He is, he is the son. He was born to a woman. What's he doing here? So the Almighty responds, well, he's here to get the Torah. And this really sends them into a tizzy. What? They say to say to God, a hidden treasure that's been hidden with you for 974 generations before the world was created. You want to give it to flesh and blood? So again, it's interesting to note, like we mentioned earlier, Moses is a Yaludi. He was born to a woman. Once this idea is presented that he's going to bring the Torah, the, the godly Torah, the divine Torah, he's going to give it to humanity, well, then humanity is already flesh and blood. But if you remember, if you notice, he picked up on it. How do the angels describe the Torah? They describe the Torah as a hidden treasure 
that's been hidden with God for 974 generations before the creation of the world. Okay. So just to finish the story, the postscript of the story is, is that God tells Moses, well, if you want to take the Torah, you have to, you have to placate these angels. And Moses tells this God, well, I'm scared they're going to kill me. They're going to incinerate me. So God tells Moses, grab onto the throne and you'll be okay. And then Moses engages in the argument, in the dialogue with the angels and is able to prove that the Torah belongs to humans and not to angels. What does the Torah say? Honor your parents. Do you have parents? What does the Torah say? I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. Were you in Egypt? Were you enslaved to Pharaoh? Don't murder. Don't, don't commit adultery. Do you have impulses to do things like that? Clearly, says Moses, the Torah belongs to us. It's there to perfect the fallible, the imperfect, not for the perfect, not for the static angels. Anyhow, that's the story and that the angels actually really liked Moses and they gave him a secret, which appears later on in the Torah. And things worked out well. But amidst this very interesting teaching, again, for the book of Shabbos in the Talmud, page 88b, it goes up to to 89a, we find this idea that the Torah preceded the world by 974 generations. Now, Rashi, by the way, in his commentary on this Talmud tells us, that's not a random number. Why? 974 is 26 fewer than 1,000. And Moses is 26 generations from Adam. 10 from Adam to Noah. 10 from Noah to Abraham. 6 from Abraham to Moses. So you have a perfect 1,000 generations from when the Torah was created by God, 974 generations before the creation of the world, until it was delivered to this world via Moses. So Rashi tells us these are not random numbers. But regardless, we see that this concept is found in multiple Jewish sources, that there was some existence that preceded our world. We have the Almighty creating worlds and destroying worlds. We have the Torah predating our world by 974 generations. There's something here to work with. So let's give some some context to this idea. If there were worlds that preceded ours, what do we know about those worlds? So the Sefer HaTemun, again, this is the Kabbalistic work that is attributed to one of the Tanaim, to one of the Mishnahic era rabbis. He talks about the idea of a Shemitah. Shemitah, in fact, appears in many places in the Torah. Shemitah is the idea of the sabbatical. For six years, you work the field. You plow, you plant, you harvest, and then the seventh year you take off. The land lies fallow. And it's a similar model. Six days we work, Shabbos we don't work. And then you have, of course, the, the Jubilee cycle. You have seven years. I said, what's, that's one seven-year unit. And then you have seven seven-year units. So that's 49 years. And then you have the 50th year, the Jubilee cycle. Very important motif in, in Jewish law. Talmud tells us, this is probably an idea that most of, most people have heard. This world is destined to last for 6,000 years. So Talmud, the book of Sanhedrin, I think it's page 97 or 98 or 99a. This world is a 6,000 year world. We have 220 years to go. Let's celebrate. <laughs> it's a 6,000 year world. And then what's the seventh year? The seventh year is like Shabbos. So we see the same model. Six years. The seventh year, six days, the seventh day. Six thousand years, the seventh thousand years. So the Sefer Torah talks about this idea. The previous worlds were also in this kind of format. Six thousand years plus seven, destroyed. Six thousand years plus seven, destroyed. And then he tells us like this. When our world was created, it's the beginning of a new Shemitah cycle. Not the Shemitah cycle of seven days or the Shabbos cycle, seven days and then one day. And not even the yearly cycle, six years and then and then a seventh year. It's 6,000 years and then a 7,000th year. Okay. So there are previous worlds and they were all 7,000 year worlds and then they were destroyed. So how far along are we? Has it been 7,000 years and now our world starts? Has it been 14,000 years and then our world starts? 
That's an interesting question. So there are various different speculations. And each one of these, by the way, are based upon legitimate arguments. These are not people just spitballing ideas. According to some, they theorize that our world begins in the second Shemitah cycle. So you have 7,000 years, and then you have the new creation of the world, our world, Adam, and now we start the the second round of 7,000 years, which would get us a little bit closer to reconciling the question. You know, we're not only 6,000 years old, according to Jewish history. Maybe here we're 6,000 plus the previous 7,000. So we're in the 13,000s. So we're getting closer to resolving our dilemma. According to others, we're not in the, in the second, we're in the fourth. However, the most authoritative opinion on this question is that we are in the seventh Shemitah cycle. And therefore, when Adam was created, how old was the world? It had already experienced six Shemitah cycles. So six units of 7,000 years. Ergo, the world was at least 42,000 years old when Adam was created. When this world, when this iteration of the world was created. We're getting a lot closer. And therefore, if you add around 6,000 years to that, we're, we're nearing 50,000. We only have, you know, many, many billions left to go (laughs) to reconcile this idea with what the scientific consensus is around 15 billion years. Now, I want to stress this concept, even though it's very Kabbalistic, it is found in many of the mainstream commentators in the Torah, including Rabbeinu Bachai, one of the medieval commentators, the Rikanti, the Sefer HaChinuch is a 13th century era book on, on mitzvos. It's found explicitly in many sources. It's alluded to in other sources. Some would argue that the Ramban hints at it, the Ibn Ezra. These are are some of the most important names in uh, in Jewish literature. And therefore, going back to our sources, when the Midrash says they might create worlds and destroy them, that's part of this these previous Shemitah cycles. 974 generations before our world in a previous Shemitah cycle. And here's the final point. One of the great Kabbalists, his name was Rabbi Yitzchak Dimin Akko. He was a confidant of the Ramban of Nachmanides. He lived in Akko, northern Israel. At the same time, the Ramban was there. Of course, the Ramban fled Spain, moved to Israel, and he had a, a confidant who was someone that they would study together. He was, in fact, considered one of the great Kabbalists of his era. And when the Zohar appeared... And the question about the authorship of the Zohar, he was the one who verified the veracity of the Zohar. He adds one critical ingredient, one critical mind-blowing ingredient to this calculation. And again, remember, it's important to remember this is written over 700 years ago. This is not in 1968 or something like that. All the rabbis are scrambling, oh no, how do we reconcile? This is an ancient, ancient teaching. He says like this, yes, we're accepting the premise of the previous Shemitah cycles. However, prior to Adam, we're not using human years. We're using godly, divine years. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean, godly years? So we have scripture coming in to help us. There's a first inscription, Psalms 90, verse 4. Ki elef shanim be'enecha, ki yom et avar. For a thousand years are in your eyes like yesterday that has passed. This verse is telling us that one day of God equals one thousand years of us. So let's do the math. If one day of God is one thousand human years, then how long is one year of God? If one day of God equals 1,000 human years, one year of God, it's 1,000 times 365 and a quarter, 365,250 human years equals one godly year. So again, let's just put all the pieces together before we do the calculation. We have... The illusions in, in the Talmud and the Midrash 
there were worlds that preceded ours, or there were times, there's, there's epochs that preceded ours. And then we find a very ancient teaching in the Kabbal, in the, in the Kabbalistic work called Sefer Timuna, but the idea of a Shemitah, the idea of 6,000 year, 6,000 plus one or 7,000 year blocks and ours is also following the same model, 6,000 years plus one. And then we find the most authoritative interpretation of that is we've done six, we're on the seventh, we're on the seventh and last. And then we add another ingredient from Rabbi Yitzchak Demin Akro that tells us that no, before Adam, the time that we're using is not human years, it's godly years. And a godly year is 365,250 human years. And how many years before Adam was the original creation? 42,000. 42,000 godly years. If you do the math, 42,000 times 365,250, 15.4 billion years. <laughs> now I want to stress that each one of these parts, each one of these moving parts is ancient. We're talking about works that are not recent works. None of them are within the last 700 years. These are ancient, ancient works. It's not modern day apologetics. And I'm not necessarily saying this is the only opinion. Remember, we have the Arizal who says, the worlds that preceded ours, those are spiritual worlds. Those are not worlds that can be used to try to tally up, to get an answer to our question. And again, there's other answers, and we're not going to question the legitimacy of those other answers. But it is noteworthy that you do have one opinion in the Kabbalistic, or if you cobble together these various Kabbalistic teachings based upon, again, ideas that are found in the Talmud of the Midrash, there were worlds that preceded ours. And they're in 7,000-year blocks. And we're in the seventh, meaning that 42,000 years before Adam was the original creation. And then you add the factor that these are not human years. They're godly years. You arrive at the exact same number that the scientists have arrived. And now you have harmony between the Torah and science. Again, God's wisdom and God's handiwork fit in beautifully dovetail to perfection. Again, with no apologetics, these are ancient, ancient teachings.